and welcome once again to the How Long to Beat podcast. I'm Rick, joined by Alex and Paula. And this, I'm sad to say, is the last episode of Otome. Aww. Oh. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> so, um, and, and the sadness is going to compound because I don't think me and Alex quite took it the way that Paula was hoping we will. But <laughs> there's lots to talk about there. So we're going to forego the usual topic in question. Uh, we're still going to tell you about what we've beaten, retired and played. Uh, but then we're just going to give in to the pretty boys. We're going to talk about Psychedelica, the good, the bad, and the, the Hue X machina. Um, and then we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll finish off with everyone's favourite game. How, How long, long to, to beat, beat the, game. the game? Oh, dear. Speaking of games, Paolo, I'm so excited. You've beaten not one but three Picross games. Tell us more. Bruh. Oh, I'm finally <laughs> out of Picross Hill. No! For the no time being, at the very least. And Picross E6 and Picross E7 pretty much are like more or less the same in terms of how good the puzzles were and how they pretty much like reuse stuff like for the macro section. But overall, it was just puzzle game to pass the time with. Also, Sanrio Characters Picross has one of the cutest interfaces I've seen in a long, long time. So it pretty much like took the a very vanilla and boring uh, interface and I fed up to 11 because like the Sanri characters are like these cute mascot characters like Hello Kitty and Cinnamon Roll and stuff like that. They made it so for each puzzle you complete you get like a bunch of kit stamp and you can actually like customize the backgrounds of both the puzzle sections and the menus and stuff. Uh, which I actually spent quite a lot of time with that because I was like oh I'm, I'm tired of uh, pictures I'm gonna just fuck around for a little while, and then everything was pretty and was like, oh, okay, back to Picross. I think I can't go back to Vanilla Picross anymore, and I'm going to stick to, like, the theme ones, because they do more interesting stuff, or, like, they actually, like, look stuff like the mini, um, the squares from the mini Picross sections. Uh, you actually have to beat Picross and Mega Picross levels to get those, and then complete the, the big picture, pretty much. Hmm. I've, um, um, I've just jumped no. on the website. I didn't realize Samria, because obviously they're the Hello Kitty people. They also do Agretsuko, the uh, the Netflix karaoke Red Fox, I love and Yudatama, like the melancholic egg yolk thing, which is oh. just like massive mood. Sorry, crack on. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Uh, so yeah, that's Picross. I think I'm gonna take a long break from this uh, until I eventually get like the Overlord theme pictures on Nintendo Switch. Also, and this one is kind of cheating because I actually I finished my second run of Breath of the Wild, but I'm just jumping straight into the third run. Um, I ended up like cutting my adventure on this day file, short, because it took me 118 hours to actually go and beat Ganondor. Ganon. Um, and that, that's cutting it short. That was cutting it short. God damn! <laughs> my oh, first God. playthrough was 168 hours. <laughs> I don't even think... Okay, hold on. I'm pretty sure my... 78 th hours, sorry. I think. My I don't God. know. Help. Some help. <laughs> There's an easy way to find out. There's a website called How Long to Beat where you can log this stuff. Well, I'm checking yeah, mine but... right now because I know... Yeah, okay. I did about 75 hours in that game. So yeah, that that's fair. It, it's a pretty long game. I mean, you can really get obsessed into it pretty easily. That is true. So I'm actually like... Well, I finished my second uh, run to pretty much go into a third run, and I sent a screenshot to uh, Rick and Alex last night, I think it was. And I actually, like, surpassed the 300 hours playing this game in a single account, because that doesn't count the stupid challenge I've been doing, too. Oh, that's separate? The whole bingo that thing. is separate. Oh, holy <laughs> shit. Okay. Well, I mean, I guess with the bingo thing, that's only about another seven hours onto it, I suppose, but still. Yeah. It was I'm... about seven hours. Bingo's a drop uh, in the bucket. It... Yeah, pretty much, I think. I'm laughing, but I've got my Rocket League playtime in the back of my head. I can't really say anything. <laughs> yeah, you can't talk. Yeah, but at least that is like multiplayer. Like, yeah, you're actually I'm... like playing with other people. I'm just like <laughs> going solo in Breath of the Wild and now like. Yeah, pretty much going solo in Breath of the Wild for 300 hours. Damn. I've uh, also had the game for like five and a half years, so I have spread it a little bit longer. <laughs> that is true. 
Though Breath uh, of the Wild's been out for a long time now. Um, what was it? 2017? When the yeah. 2017, came out? yeah. Four years already. It's been four years. Yeah. It's been four years. So, just kind of insane. <laughs> just a little bit. So, the word is the Switch Pro is coming out in September, so I guess I, it's the right time. Fantasy Critic League with Breath of the Wild 2 as a launch title. <laughs> that'd be dope. Please, I mean, please. That makes sense. I feel yeah. like, I don't know, if, maybe, but that'd be dope. That'd be dope. Enough about the Breath of the Wild for now. Alex, what have you been playing? Yeah, I beat a bunch of shit this week. I beat Mass Effect, which, okay, like, I started talking about this a bit last week. Like, I, I just, I love Mass Effect so much. And I mean, as I played this first game, I was really, I was amazed at how much they reveal right away. Like, if you've beaten the game, the series, you realize that, like, holy shit, they foreshadow stuff, like, right away. And... To the point that when I played it originally, you you weren't paying that much attention to certain elements, right? Like when you first play it, you don't know where the story's going, so it's all new to you. And so I think it's really expertly done. And they establish a world so well and so quickly. And it makes me like, God damn it. I'm like, why aren't there movies about the Mass Effect universe? Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's such a good universe and it's so well realized that it makes me sad that there isn't just more in it more side stories and more fun things to do. But anyway, as for the first game, you know, it's hard for me to recommend this game in some ways because while I absolutely adore it and I do think it's excellent, I do recognize that it's got some weird choices and those choices are very early 2000s choices, you know, or like mid 2000s, I should say, actually, in the sense that like combat's not great. If you're playing as a character who has powers, yikes, because you're gonna have to open a radial wheel every time and then select the power you want, and then let it go. It's like very kind of turn basey, but also not, which isn't, it's not awesome. Your AI companions are pretty stupid. <laughs> uh, they hold their own, <laughs> but like, I can't count the amount of times where I was like, bruh, stop walking in front of me. I'm trying to shoot the alien. <laughs> like, you know, It's just like, every minute I've got like, freaking Liara's running in front of my face and I'm like, stop it! (laughs) I don't know how many times I accidentally shot my teammates. They make a lot of excellent improvements. Like, if you were to play this game, like, it completely replaces the original game in every sense of the matter. Like, there is zero reason to go back and play the first game in in its original format. Um, And I mean that in all the best ways. Like, it just completely modernizes it. And it looks gorgeous, which is quite impressive for a game of its age and even for a remake. You know, like, sometimes remakes that come along and, yeah, they look, you know better-ish but this one it's just across the board that all being said <laughs> if you play this game and you find yourself getting a little stuck and you're just like Ugh, i'm not sure i love this i really think it's worth skipping to the second game because i think that second game is so it is one of the greatest games ever made it's one of the best pieces of art i've ever played i just love it and i think that it onboards you really well because A little bit of history for this. The first one was for a period of time an Xbox exclusive and like PC as well. And I don't think it was ever on a PlayStation console. And then when Mass Effect 2 came along, they decided to expand that, obviously, because, you know, (laughs) PlayStation was starting to pick up Steam, too. They want they want all that, you know, come on, you want that money, more money. Yeah. Yeah. So what they did is they did this thing that had this kind of comic and like thing that would play before the game. And it basically allowed you to make all of the big choices of the first game. So all the big things that would impact the second game. So like if you really don't like the first one, you can always jump into the second one and you can just go through that comic and you can see what the story of the first game was and you can make the decisions of the first game so that you still have decisions uh, following over into your second one. Is it the same as playing it? God, no. There's so much good shit in that first game that you will miss if you just do that comic. But again, I just think it is better to do that than to retire the whole series, you know, like if you were on the first one, uh, because it's just so worth it. Uh, anyway, that's that's like my like <laughs> lukewarm defense of my, one of my favorite games of all time. <laughs> like it's so, you know what I mean? It's so weird. It's like, it's kind of like what the Otome would talk about later. This is an acquired taste. I was brought in on it when it first came out and I love the shit out of it, but I can see how some people wouldn't. And I, I just want people to love the Mass Effect series. So I'm like, get into it however you see fit, you know? Um, don't feel like you have to play through all of them. And then also on the, on the side of sci-fi, that's kind of, uh, okay, uh, Halo 4, <laughs> beat that and co-op. The black chief of the family. Yeah, really though. Uve's play, Uve finished this one too and sort of commented on how like it's it's weird. And, and I would agree, it, it is weird in the sense that it does feel like, you know, a new new group is bringing it on. But I also think that 
I think it's maybe unfairly critiqued. And I think I think that some of the shit that it gets critiqued for is bullshit that's in the other Halos. <laughs> but like, there's this kind of reverence for Bungie that I've never understood. But I like Bungie. Don't get me wrong. Good, you know, great, I guess. But like, those games are good. They're not like fucking paragons of video gaming. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, they're fun. Uh, they don't have to be more than they are. But the first three Halo story is incomprehensible. I have no fucking clue what happened in that game there were prophets who ride in little cherry things flood halo rings that's about the most i could tell you yeah rick's like going over his head because that's exactly what it is <laughs> and halo 4 is weird because it's like a love story between chief and cortana which i was like no one asked for this it's not really like it's not really like they never actually you know it's more like a deep friendship. We'll put it that way. So on, on a scale of like one to Sonic 06, it's like a seven. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, yeah. It's like, it's kind of in that. Actually, yeah, yeah. I never played Sonic 06, but I know what you're talking about. And I think it's in that world. <laughs> oh, it's just some yeah. of the scenes, yeah. are, some of the scenes are just a little like, <laughs> you're like. <laughs> She's just dropped for power. <laughs> yeah, right. It's well, like... I, I, yeah. It just connected for me, like right now. So sorry, but was, I was still. No, that's okay. It's just it's oh. it's it, it's coded romance. You know what I mean? Like, there's never anything. Like, come on, they're not like making out or some shit. It's just like it's coded in romantic language, and you know. Cortana's always like, don't let a girl down, which she did say bullshit like that in the other games too that I always thought was weird. But anyway, why did they feminize an AI so much? And I, whatever, I don't even want to get into this. There's like a canon reason in Halo Reach, but it's so stupid. It's so oh, profoundly yeah. stupid that like, I don't even want to get into it. But anyway, what, <laughs> weirdness aside, what I will say is that the first two levels in that game are a little weird because they basically have to like retcon the fact that like Halo 3 ended as like, Master Chief's like floating in space and they have to find a reason why Master Chief is no longer floating in space. So they did the best they could, I think. Um, but then after those first two missions go, it's fucking Halo. And I gotta say, the guns have never felt better. Like 343 make the guns in Halo feel really fucking good. Like they are weighty and punchy and like the assault rifles feel like assault rifles. Like they always felt kind of, I don't know, weird. I don't know how to describe it, but it's like when you would play them in the into Halo games, they're just kind of like, and they just kind of go and they don't feel like they have any weight to them. But the assault rifles in this one, they feel like they're tactile, you know, like he's like slotting things in and there's like punchy sound effects and like the, the weapon and the muzzle flash and the animation, like it's just really well done. Um, and I felt like they made you pick up enemy weapons way more often in this one, which I appreciated because in the earlier games, I could pretty much use the assault rifle and the battle rifle the entire time and I'd find enough ammo. Like, I rarely ever had to pick up a weapon. But in this one, it's more like, no, bro, you're out because you're on an alien fucking planet. So why would you have battle rifles everywhere? Like, you got to go find a new weapon. And the new weapons are pretty cool. So I was I was kind of happy that they made me do that. I was like, all right, I kind of feel like I have to actually explore the weapons that you have in this game. Though, you know, you'll still find the one you like and go through. It's also hard as balls at points. Like, we died way more in Halo 4 than we died in the other Halos especially reach we'd gotten real good and then halo 4 we're just like ah there's so many <laughs> which was nice there's an ending bit where you're flying in this vehicle and I, I look i loved it i can see why a lot of people would hate it um because it's like we were never it's like a trench run mission um and it reminded me of like the x-wing and tie fighter game so i was like i was on board i'm like fuck yeah like give me a quick trench run any day and i will be happy so yeah anyway that's that's what i think of halo I, look i think it is as good as like halo 2 or like something like that you know what i mean like to me it's like kind of like that game halo 2 had some bullshit in it where you're like you're on these stupid gondolas where you're just sitting there and you're like what? and then like the enemies come and you're like great like there was a lot of waiting around in that game and i think um if i had to put them on like a level i would put them there like halo 1 reach and o and reach are like my top sort of tier halo 3 is like right above that and then it's like halo 4 and halo 2 that's kind of, that's kind of where i put them very unofficially don't come at me <laughs> i don't i don't care enough about halo <laughs> sorry i got a lot so I'm, I'm also gonna talk a little bit about i beat this really random game so i hacked my snes mini oh Oh yeah, it's really easy to do actually. And I recommend it to anyone who's got them. If you want a nice thing and oh my God, it's on my, um, I have it on my nice, you know, 4K TV because it's got the HDMI and in pixel perfect mode, mm, it looks real good. I also would say the CRT mode looks real nice on a 4K as well, but the pixel perfect looks beautiful. And I got the adventures of Batman and Robin, which is like, uh, it's the 90s, 
you know, Batman animated series. That good one, which if anybody watched it back in the day. Yeah, okay, Rick's like, I don't know. So I was before my time. I'm sorry. <laughs> what are you talking about? You like I'm raised like around the same lost. time as I was. But all right, never mind. Maybe that didn't hit you. But it was before me as well. But it was rerunning when I was um, when I was a kid. Uh, like, you know, like Transformers, okay. all that shit reran. Um, when I was, I'm telling you, they made them once and then they were like, let's play these forever. <laughs> But I was obsessed with that Batman as a kid. And so I saw this and I was like, oh, I'll try it out. It's a brawler, eight stages. I, I I really liked it. I mean, it's developed by Konami. It's hard as fucking shit. It's a two-hour game that they turned into like probably a three-year odyssey if you were a child. Like, I don't know how you would have beaten this game as a kid because holy shit, the bosses are fucking insane. Like, you have to become perfect to beat them. But... If you have save states and a rewind feature, it's extremely fun. Because <laughs> there's something, <laughs> do you know what I mean? There's something kind of satisfying about like taking down something that feels that difficult when you've got some tools to help you do it. Um, if I had to play it on my own, I would have retired it probably on the first stage. And it's also unfortunate because the second stage of this game is the worst stage in the entire game. And it really sucks that that's the second one. Um, it's like you're going against Poison Ivy and the boss is some real bullshit because you, you're no longer allowed to punch in that one. You can only throw a Batarang, which I don't really know why. I think it's because you don't want to actually hurt anyone in that one because they're just maybe innocent or something. I don't know. It doesn't really explain why you have to suddenly use a Batarang the whole time. Hang on, uh, so you don't want to harm them and they're innocent, so actually you're going to throw a really sharp metal object at them instead of punching There's them. no logic in this game, man. <laughs> <laughs> you're in the wrong place if you're looking for logic. <laughs> okay. Um... <laughs> But essentially, like, you're going through, like, the rogues gallery, which is really neat. Like, each stage is based off of a different person. And, and they actually change up each stage. Like, it's not the same thing every time. It's different each time, which I really appreciate it. Combat's, like, a little bit slow, but it works well enough. It's punching. You've got all these gadgets. Like, half of them you're never going to use, but you can select a couple unique ones when you go into, into stages. There's a cool one with, like, the penguin where you're, like you're infiltrating like a building and you go up different levels and you have to like go find people and rescue them and stuff. And yeah, I don't know. I just, I kind of liked it. Like if you have two hours and you're playing with save states, like you do not play this game without save states. Cause you'll hate it. Um, and if you have nostalgia for the Batman animated series, um, and there was one called the adventures of Batman and Robin, which was also the animated. Anyway, whatever it's, they're all the same. If you have nostalgia for those, you'll probably really like this game. And if you like brawlers, um, you know, like those side scroller kind of smack smack people around kind of games. So yeah. Anyway, that's that's another one that I played. I'm gonna be going through a bunch of SNES games. So get ready over the next few weeks, listeners. You're gonna hear about a lot of probably weird SNES games. Uh, I'm currently playing. I'm, I'm a little sneak preview for next week. Mickey Mouse is up on my list. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh yeah, the magical quest starring Mickey Mouse. <laughs> Anyway, I'm talking too long. I got one more that I got to go on. And then Rick, take it away from me. But uh, I also beat Spiral of the Dragon in the Reignited Trilogy one. So the remake. Holy. They are so good. There is a little bit of bullshit in this, but but not too much. The ending kind of soured me a little. But like, this game's excellent. I never played Spyro when I was a kid, but holy Christ, it feels good. Like the movement, like Toys for Bob who remade this, they did some freaking wonders in this game. Um, It's gorgeous first off like absolutely gorgeous beautiful cartoon uh, animation the animations themselves are great the movement is fluid the fact that i love that each so it's like broken up it's a -a collectathon, right but the way they do it is really 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 satisfying you never have to backtrack like you can 100 percent each level on each go if you want Uh, and you can especially 100 percent it if, which I did, I 100 percented the game, which I never do, but it just kind of encourages you to do it in a nice way because it shows you the percentages on like uh, after each world. And it's like, oh, bro, you got 99. You sure you don't want that last one? And you're like, and they also gate off a last level. You have to get 100 percent to get this last kind of level, which is sort of just a fun level where you, yeah, and I won't spoil it. It's very fun. But something the game doesn't tell you, and it wasn't in the original game, which is probably why it doesn't tell you in the game. But they have they added a thing from later games where if you press in the left stick, your little dragonfly, because you have this dragonfly that goes around you, kind of represents your health, sparks, will point where the nearest treasure is. This is invaluable because when you've lost, like, you've got, like, you know, one fucking gem left in the level and you don't know where it is. I wasn't trying for 100% at first because I didn't know about this feature until I watched fucking Exo Paradigm Gamer. He does these remake or rebreak videos and he did one on Spyro and he fucking mentioned this thing and I went, oh, what? Like, 
was like, I had no idea I could do this. I, why would I have ever tried to click the left stick, right? Like, th- that wasn't a thing in PlayStation 1 games. How PlayStation 1 didn't have fucking analog sticks. So, like, you know? I mean, later it did. But at first it didn't, right? So, um, anyway, if you're playing this game, this is my fucking PSA to you. Click that left stick, man, because it's going to help you a lot. Have either of you played the Spyro games? Oh, but I have the Reignited Trilogy on my PS4 backlog. Oh, you got to do it. It's so good. Uh, yeah, I played one of them, but it was one of the PS2 ones, one of like the, the dark days of Spyro. Oh, sort of yeah. It wasn't great. It wasn't great. Uh, but I'm, I'm also not really big in like 3D collector funds anyway. So no, not... no, no, no. That's no. Shh, child. <laughs> um, <laughs> listen. <laughs> You don't have to like collectathons like this game. This game is not a collectathon as you think of it, you know? Like, it's just not. And and one of the reasons is that in a lot of collectathons, like Banjo-Kazooie and shit like that, you have to backtrack all the fucking time. And to find things, it's kind of just like out-of-the-way shit. But in Spyro, something that I love is that enemies also have gems. And so you're actually encouraged to do everything in the level in a very natural way. And so, and each level is only like 10 minutes long. So sometimes less than that like you could beat a level in a couple minutes so i'd actually suggest if you don't like collectathons play the spiral reignited trilogy because i think it's one of those games where it's like oh here is the con- the concept of collectathon perfected and in a way that i think everyone can enjoy because i know you're like gameplay first kind of dude. you'll love this spiral feels so fucking good and is so excellent to control that i highly recommend it um, it's a little insight into my mind when you said this collectathon's perfect i just went Perfectathon. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I love it. That's what I'm calling this. Spyro is a perfectathon. Oh. The only thing I didn't like about it, the only fucking thing, is the last goddamn boss. It does this bullshit where, like, you, okay, so you have to chase these, like, there's like these things called egg thieves. People who play don't know what I'm talking about. They run around and you have to, you have to grab them. You have to like fire them because um, you you can charge and use fire to uh, hit people. They're a little too fast in this game. In the last boss, you have to chase two of them to unlock some keys and then you have to chase the final boss now the final boss at one point goes over these kind of pits that you got to jump over now spyro has a jump and glide mechanic so you jump and then you glide spyro's tiny he can't fly um but the issue is if you're going at a ledge and spyro and you jump and you hit the glide but maybe you don't hit the glide quite at the right moment spyro doesn't have any kind of climb mechanic Right, so you know, in a lot of 3D platformers, you hit a ledge, so you bounce up. off the side of it. I understand exactly. what you're saying. You don't if, mantle. Yeah, mm-hmm. if you're slightly below, so like if his feet are like just at the level, he'll kind of you know push up onto the level and it'll be okay. But it's like just a little too below it, and you just bump and off. And then what happens is that you have to redo the entire boss fight again. So there's this one moment at the end that I kept hitting this fucking stupid thing, and I'd have to redo everything, and I was like bro, why can't you just checkpoint me? Like, I beat the other parts. You know I can do it. Just let me come back to this part. But anyway, it wasn't that big of a deal. you've unsolved me. not playing it now. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) But but honestly, it's not that tough because I realized that right after that moment, you win. So I was like, all right, fine. Um, It, like, wasn't that bad. So I was like, okay, I'll overlook it. But anyway. Oh, yeah, that's enough for me. I'm fucking ranting and raving about all the games I've played. Rick, what about you? You played even more than I did, so... I, well, I yeah. did. I've got six completions, uh, and I'll, I'll try and barrel through them. So, the first one, and um, if, if you guys cast your mind a couple of weeks back, I said the only way I was beating this is if the cup I was currently playing was the last one. And it turned out it was, and this is uh, Mario Tennis Open. Cannot in good conscience recommend this to anybody. It is the most bare-bones fucking phoned-in attempt at tennis. And the Oof. one, like, sort of unusual thing it does which is the the special shots if you stand on the right place and press the right button one you can automate by just pressing x because that automatically does the right shot and two they throw off your entire strategy because actually it won't necessarily be the right shot at the right time that it recommends you it's somewhat arbitrary feels like they're very skewed towards um the enemy ai as well so they basically they've ruined tennis is what i'm trying to say tennis has been fine in games for like two decades now and they've ruined it so don't just, just don't on a much happier note i then beat cosmic star heroin uh for the vita the only two negatives and i'll get them out of the way quickly so i can talk about the positives are one performance on vita is very hit and miss hmm. um i actually had a crash between beating the last boss and the credits rolling which i didn't mind because by then i'd like perfected my strat and i just went and did it again um but until i i deleted my bubble um and then re 
installed it and my save. I was just getting crashes all the time. It it feels like the build is a little bit unstable. Uh, the other thing is like the, there's a couple of quality of life things that are missing, particularly around um, equipment. So when you're buying equipment, it mm. won't tell you how many you've got in the inventory, whether it's equipped, whether it's going to increase or decrease. It doesn't really give you any opportunity to compare the special effects of those equipments versus what you've got equipped. But because it's so streamlined, most of the time you'll know what you're running anyway. And everything else about the game is just wonderful. They take a lot of the, and, and you'll know this, Alex, if you've played a bit of it, they take a lot of the, the staples of 90s JRPGs and improve them or streamline them or excise them. There's clear Chrono Trigger influences. I wouldn't say it's on that level, but you can tell that they've, they've taken a lot of plays from that playbook, right down to the main character having unite attacks and you can almost see like on the design document they crossed out dual text and triple text yes and they're like shit what do we call these now the point is it's really fucking good there's no mana points or anything to bother about the game is designed around that you don't have health to manage because it heals at the end of every turn or at the end of every battle rather and items rather than having an inventory you need to manage items are found and then they are one use per battle and they replenish like everything else so it cuts all of the fluff and all the menu bollocks that would typically drag you down in a game like this. Also, and this is advice you gave to me, Alex, and it's what I would extend to anyone else who does and rightfully should be considering playing this. Play it on heroin difficulty. I didn't have any problems playing that. If you're playing to do the side content, you'll never feel underleveled. The only maybe thing is because the game sort of angles itself as being a thing where you can avoid battles if you want. I never felt like I really wanted to. I don't know that there were that many opportunities particularly to, but if you were to try and do that, maybe heroin, you'd find yourself at points needing to grind a little bit. Yeah, I that's what... that like if you avoid battles, it's a stupid idea. Like it's it's a fucking RPG. You need the experience. <laughs> the battles are fun though. Like and yes, one of the things again that it does in terms of streamlining lining that I like. Enemies don't regenerate each battle on the map. Once you've done it, it's done. And how it then accommodates if you do want to grind is there's an option in the menu called battle. So once you've cleared all the enemies on a map, you can then just initiate combat at will. And so then if you do want to grind, you're not like winding your D-pad out, running around in circles until you can like trigger a battle. Equally, if you want to go back through an area to pick up a side quest you didn't get the first time, uh, you haven't got to then do those battles again to get there. Mm -hmm. it, there's so many instances like that in the game where the developers have said, where's the fun? what's getting in the way of the fun and how can we remove that to get you there faster and the final thing that that comes down to is the length so mm -hmm. i clocked the whole thing and i think i was one side quest and a couple of achievements off 100 percent run uh, i clocked it in 16 hours beautiful length exactly as much as i wanted pitched perfectly really really happy with it and um it it softened the blow of how much i paid for the feet of physical of it <laughs> oh yeah because uh, <laughs> i i did not get that straight from limited run i paid someone more than i should have done in the Ooh. second hand market yeah but, uh, my thing is like if the game had a better story i think i would have stuck with it um the story gets better i actually quite liked it it, it feels yeah. very sort of campy star wars-esque sci-fi but i feel like they just about straddle that line and that is going to be a personal preference thing. yeah but for me i felt like that was okay i didn't really have an issue well no it's not so much having an issue it's just that like it wasn't enough to keep me engaged in the gameplay. You know what I mean? Like, it was like, I was like, why, why do I care? Cause I'm like, my thing was like, the game has to give me a reason, you know, I need a reason why I'm playing this. And it can't just be because, but our systems are good, which is like, that's me though. That's exactly me. That's exactly no, I know. I hear you, but I just, it's just, that's not enough. You know what I mean? Like uh, it, it's nice, but it's not enough. So yeah. It, it, for 16 hours at least you know what i mean like i was like for the amount of time i played it i was very pleased and that's a retirement that i left you know i made that i made that decision in my head where i went i could keep going and hate this game or i could stop now and like this game so that's why i did i stopped and i was like i, I only have fond memories of cosmic star heroin <laughs> but i knew if i kept going i'd be like guys come on like it's the classic Alex half match recommendation. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. But if you're if you're more of a Rick player and like systems are just your fucking jam, then like yeah, you're gonna have a great time. <laughs> and and speaking of half match recommendations, let's uh, let's skip one that I played in between and turn to Scourgebringer, hmm. which uh, I I got to the final boss just before we recorded last week with Everdread, hmm. and I finished just after. Now 
I have a slight confession to make. In the menu in Scourgebringer, there is an option to make yourself invulnerable under accessibility. <laughs> Faced with the prospect of having to do all the games to get to the final boss again, you bet your ass I turned that on. Mm. So, <laughs> I, uh, I, I... <laughs> I beat the uh, I beat the final boss on the first try. I think I settled on an eight for the game. Maybe that was a touch generous. My my thoughts ultimately didn't change because I didn't I didn't play much more than than when I did last week. So everything I said last week still applies. Where I think I sit on it now is that I could forgive the progression system. I could forgive some of the the lacking areas in other regards if the smash attack worked like it should or like it feels it should. Hmm. I think I think if they tuned that one aspect of the game, I would recommend it to anyone and it'd be a 9 out of 10. Particularly because they, they nail the audio-visual. They do quite a lot right in terms of game feel, accessibility, lore. Because there, there is actually an interesting semblance of a story behind it all, which for a, an indie roguelite is not necessarily a given. Hmm. But I think it's a tricky one ultimately to recommend i i have no regrets because i i was always going to buy it. it's one of the last games on vita the the visuals appeal to me the audio is lovely so I've, I've i've got that soundtrack coming with my with my physical copy as and when that arrives so i i've got no regrets and it it's a cheap one it was only like 12 pounds or, or regional equivalent so maybe 15 dollars. and i think for that price if it looks good i think it probably is worth a go you sound like you're in an abusive this relationship the... with this game <laughs> you're like oh it's... <laughs> I like it, but I just, I don't know. It hurts me so much. It was, it was nice, but it just... <laughs> I, Stop and Minute to minute, I was, like, bouncing, as I said last week, between a six and a nine. Mm -hmm. There'd be moments like, fuck this, what the fuck am I supposed to do there? How can you expect me to do that? It's hit me and I've hit it. What? And then yeah. you'd hit a flow state and you'd clear a couple of rooms just zipping around because it, it, there's so much empowerment with the speed you have uh, and the ability to maintain airtime mm. and, and bounce between enemies and although there's not well there is a combo system to chain attacks and hits and and, and move around there are moments where it is poetry in motion nice. and, and this is the issue because it doesn't straddle the line so much as it oscillates either side of it so it's, oh, no. it's tricky i'm going to try to save but... you <laughs> tell us about another <laughs> game rick <laughs> 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 This is, you know, this is more melancholy because this was the final to date uh, mm. game on my Cecile Richard backlog adventure. Uh, this is topography. So it's another bitsy five minute experience. This one is very much focused around the, the imagery of the underground cables that run the global internet and the idea of, of the topography of those and how they connect us to other people through the lens of Tumblr, which I couldn't directly relate to because I've never used Tumblr. But the imagery and, and some of the feelings that, that she was trying to evoke with that definitely connected and, and landed with me. Mm. As with almost all of her work, I absolutely recommend you go and check it out. I just really liked it. And I don't want to say much more because I feel like these, as a free five minute experience that you can just go and have, like on a phone, on a toaster, on a Samsung smart fridge, you should just go and do it. Stop listening to me. You don't need me to tell you what it's about. Go and <laughs> see what it's about for yourself. So yeah, that... Sad because it's ended, but but happy because it was very, very good. And I think sometime later this year, I'll maybe just marathon them, go back again and, and do something like that. That'd be quite nice. Right, nearly there. Two more. Let's keep the pace going. Um, <laughs> I played the original Klonoa, the door mm. to Phantom Isle. It's a PS1 game. I played it on my PSP, which is absolutely fine because it's literally movement and two buttons and that's it. So I have a slightly weird relationship with this one because I played the two Game Boy Advance spin-offs before I ever came to the original. And... I actually think they're better. And I, I think if you're someone who, like a really bright, breezy action platformer with sort of puzzly elements, if that sounds good to you, go and play the GBA ones because they, they're much more 2D. So Klonoa obviously being that PS1, mm -hmm. early playing on graphics era thing. So 2.5D, um, it's one of the first games that was sort of doing that thing. You can tell it's one of the first games because it can be at times incomprehensible to mm -hmm. work out where you're going. And one of the things that is a clear improvement when they go to the GBA is that they're small self-contained rooms. It's always very clear what you're supposed to do and where you're supposed to be going. They also have a slightly more puzzly bent. It's a little bit, a little bit more obvious what you're supposed to be doing. And it's a little bit more um, cerebral in that way. Because Klonoa, although it's a short game, it's only three or four hours. There are things that change over the course of those three or four hours, but probably not quite enough. 
mm. which was uh, which was a shame. But I did enjoy my time overall. It is a nice game. I would absolutely say go and check out the GBA ones before you look at it because they are they are better. I feel like I'm saying the same thing three or four times over. Well, that's um, all right. <laughs> <laughs> the last one i played is one of two expansions to motorstorm rc which is like the the vita pint-sized cousin of the motorstorm racing games it's more motorstorm i actually think i like this more than the base game just because it's a little bit shorter i already sort of knew what i was doing and those two <laughs> uh. <laughs> it, it's real good i've got one more expansion which is the carnival expansion i think i'll come to that uh in another three or four weeks again to give myself time to come nice. back to it sort of fresh-ish and enjoy it but yeah i had a really good time with that one that took me about an hour it was really nice just to pick up and down because e- each race takes sort of 30 to 60 seconds there's quite a variety of different types hmm. good stuff right so speaking of good stuff and the inverse <laughs> not good stuff let's talk about what we've retired and by we i mean alex and i because paula is laser focused on what she played and has once again got nothing <laughs> So <laughs> the Rick and Alex I've, segment, yeah, I, I, I can jump in. Go on, um, I've been talking for a long time. You jump in. Yeah, no, it's in, okay. In fact, should we talk about? Should we talk first? Well, I disappoint Keith about what we both retired, which is uh, Go Go Coco Polo. Yeah, we both retired Go Go Coco Polo 3D. I mean, but I think you know, Rick and I have sort of joked that the reason we retired this is kind of the same. Like, I don't beat puzzle games, especially if they're mm. level based. It's like with Grindstone, right? Like, I just play them until I've had my fill. And I got to about probably like, cause there's like nine, well, I think there's 10 total stages because there's like three for each of the three characters. And, and then, then there's a like final a final end. one. Yes, yeah. Right. And I beat probably like, like, I don't know, let's see, probably, yeah, like about six out of 10 of the stages, I think. I basically did that. And I was just kind of like, and then it started to get like a little more complicated, which, you know, makes sense. <laughs> it's a game. It gets more complicated as it goes on. But I also think my favorite part of the game was the dashing around and like the almost Sonic-esque gameplay of it, like going through, dashing through people. Because I was always holding the dash button because I, I, I loved it. I was never walking slowly through the game. The dash felt great. And you also have to dash to like escape people to come back. Though I get the sense that you may be supposed to walk around the map more first and then dash when your people are following you. But it's way too much fun to dash, so I just wanted to dash the whole time. But yeah, I just got to a point where I was like, also, I have way too many other games I want to play. <laughs> so I just felt like I was like, I got my fill, I'm good, and I was done. What about yeah. you, Rick? I know you had a problem with the map, which is actually funny because I actually kind of thought the map was sort of useful because I was like, oh, where are the enemies? Oh, there they are. Okay, cool. Oh, I, I was the other way. I actually, I actually thought it was uh, somewhat useless. It's my, it's my one real criticism of the game. I mean, we were joking mm-hmm. before we started recording that this game was just set up for us not to finish it. But <laughs> I think I might have actually persevered if not for the map. So there's a sense that you're supposed to walk around, get an idea of what the lay of the land is mm-hmm. and work out a strategy and then execute it. Mm-hmm. I feel like I should be able to do that broad brush from the map screen. Right. And the map is is two things that are detrimental. One, it's very zoomed in. Hmm. So you can actually only see slightly more than what you can see on the top screen anyway. Mm-hmm. That it becomes somewhat pointless to look down and up. And additionally, it doesn't show you things like the cannons. It doesn't show you what mm-hmm. orientation they are. It doesn't show you environmental hazards like spikes, things like water. Mm. And all of those things, I think, are important for it to show to aid you in doing the actual gameplay stuff. So if the, if the map was zoomed way out, even if it was slightly less, like, slightly worse visual fidelity but showed you all of those things i think that would have been enough for me to plug through quicker and actually finish the game see i think i Go on. i think i 100 percent disagree with you actually so <laughs> okay but but the reason why i'll say this is that i have a feeling that well actually we should ask keith about this um, we will have to ask him soon yes yeah just so the people know keith has agreed to do a little interview with us which we're very excited about so um mm-hmm. uh stay tuned for that next week likely as long as scheduling works out who knows but uh i think potentially they did some prototyping because what i imagine might happen is let's say what you're describing you have the bottom map and you've got that map and it's like really well displayed and then you have all the little items on it it turns into a game of using the bottom screen for the entirety of the thing you just stare at the bottom screen to get through it which i think was probably part of the problem where it's like you don't want people staring at the bottom screen that has the bad map because at that point it goes like well if you have a bottom screen that has the entire fucking map on it why don't you just on the top screen have the entire fucking map and just do you know what i mean like it's like i think there there's probably this trade-off where it's like 
yeah, you could put the whole map down there, but then you're just staring at the whole map the entire game and not a great map either. And it's like, I don't know. I I think there's a trade-off that happens if you do that. I think having the more zoomed in map that only gives you the essentials. So I would only glance down at it when I needed to know where the enemies were because it would like point at it. And then that encouraged me to learn what the map looked like so i had to learn like okay where is everything and i actually really enjoyed that element of it the only part that i got frustrated with was just um there were just some stuff that was like tripping up my like progression speeds like things that i would like hit into and i was like ah dang it how do i do this so i don't know that that's my that's where i kind of stand on it i I actually think you'd lose something if you had the full map in the bottom there yeah we're complete opposites then i (laughs) i feel like maybe there's a happy medium where you where you increase what you show on the map maybe you don't show the enemies maybe then you have to keep an eye on the top that way i the the thing is i just wanted to see more of the game space because you Mm -hmm. you can't see far in front of you at any one time and Mm -hmm. maybe that's a design thing because you're supposed to be reacting but then it's a whole slog to work out what you're doing where and and that just didn't really speak to me I think maybe what you're talking about, like potentially an in between, would be adding more of like you, like you said, the cannons or like where the traps are on the bottom map, but keeping it zoomed in more. I think that might have been um, been a little more useful. At a minimum, it should have had that. And Keith, just to just double check, we're being built by the hour for this consultancy work, right? <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee Keith knows exactly these problems. <laughs> I guarantee it. <laughs> Dude worked uh, on that yeah, game I mean, for just ages. To, yeah. Just to go briefly back um, to the GBA Klonoa games, that's one of the things that's exceptional about those because they are puzzly games. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I finished and, and loved both of them. And it, it, mm-hmm. it is just like the source has to be just right. Mm-hmm. The stars have to align for that to, to work for me and, and by extension for you, I suppose. Yeah. Um, what else have you retired? Let's, let's oh, keep yeah. the pace going. So I retired Jack and Daxter, the Precursor Legacy. Oh, man. I got to the lost Precursor City and it started pulling that real early 2000s fucking platformer bullshit where like you can't see where you're jumping it suddenly requires like very excellent platforming skills when it's not good at platforming so like that game's platforming is rough to say the least also maybe i i'm starting to learn that i don't like the vita those little fucking buttons those little fucking nubs (laughs) are so horrible listen to me rick the minute you get the switch in your hands you're gonna be like how the shit did i play with these little fucking nubs what are those stupid nubs their clicks are horrible it's like boom, boom, boom. i hurt him so much anyway sorry uh moving on. <laughs> i just oh my god i've used this switch i just don't have the same problem that you do oh but i it's don't only- have this is a you <sighs> problem alex don't pin this on yep. us <laughs> no those little playstation vita nubs man for platformers where you need to like hit them quick i'm going to talk about this in my playing in a bit but i i don't know i don't like it i don't like it they're they're nubby and weird i think i just i like the more tactile <laughs> buttons I, I you could argue this there's a slight problem like this on the game boy advance sp as well actually where the buttons on that one are a little flat too um i think there's a slight thing on that i'm i'm a real fan of those like tactile like really you can really push them and you get that good click feeling and i just don't really feel that on the vita as much but anyway that's a me thing but the game itself was doing weird platforming shit and i just realized it was it was going to become extremely frustrating from here on out and i was going to have to die a lot and redo things and it was like doing that thing where like you have to jump over water but the water's turning electrified now and you're just like oh this is no longer fun the sense of adventure and discovery is gone i'm just gonna have to grind through this section so i was like bye bye jack <laughs> Um, also it's not like there's any friggin story really so like ultimately i was like if i ever want to go play the second and third i'll just jump into them two and three operate very independently from one from a narrative perspective anyway that's what i other than knowing how daxter become daxter which i already learned right at the beginning right so like you know what i mean you're like yeah there you go Um, yeah you learn some more about jack but it's elaborated in a way that you don't need the original to follow so it's fine exactly um and the last thing i retired is biometal on the snes so Biometal is a side-scroller space shooter. Um, you know, like, it's like what's the really famous oh, one? Our type. It's a shmup. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Side-scroller. Right, right, right. It's our right. type. It, it's a knockoff of our type. So I was starting this, and the first stage, I was like, this is pretty cool. And the second stage, I was like, fuck yeah. Like, it started to get, like, real intense. Got this good, like, shield system. And it had, um, it was done by this, like, I think American, um, like, techno group did the music for it. And it's the guys behind... I think not Sandstorm, but like they remixed that. It was like the 
dan, 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 dan. Like, it was like that. And it gets real intense. And it's like going. And you're like, oh, fuck yeah. And like, I was shooting. And I was like, this is dope. Like, I'm like, you know, fucking killing shit. I'm like having a great time. Like, I was like, this is awesome. And like, it had these really great set pieces. And like, I got this wide weapon. And there was like all these enemies on the top and bottom that I could just hold the button down and make them explode like crazy. And I was like, ha ha, going nuts. Like, I just felt great. And then the third stage hits. And holy mother of God, it goes from like, this isn't, this is kind of tough, but with save states, it's okay to like, fuck you, boy, (laughs) you're not getting past me now. And I was like, oh my God, like it's just suddenly impossible. Like even with your like charged shields, they had like these fucking laser things that just blow you up right away. I was like, I couldn't get like even like a quarter of the way through it. And this should tell you something. (laughs) This game has four stages. It's 26 minutes long. You can see a long play of it easily online. And there's a walkthrough on, uh, uh, like, there's a, you know, on uh, GameFAQs or whatever. Um, and uh, <laughs> the walkthrough <laughs> stopped after the third stage. I think even the dude was like, oh, no. fuck, no, I, I, no, there's no strategy for this anymore. Oh, you just gotta, no. you just gotta, I don't know, have God reflexes. Um, so I give a wholehearted recommendation to play the first two stages of this game. And then just to stop, because really, what it's it's 12 minutes of your life. Have a great time, especially if you have a like a hacked one. Launch it on there. Play to, play those 12 minutes. And because um, listen, honest to God, I was like giggling. It was so much fun in that second stage. I was like, yay! And then I was like, whoa, no, not the third stage. So anyway, I have no experience with shmups either. So I don't know. Maybe if you're like super good at shmups, you might be able to do it. But let's be real, it's on the SNES, so like slowdown was a problem in general anyway. And sometimes you get a lot of shit on the screen here, and the game's just like would you like four frames here's two <laughs> like, all right <laughs> well, i mean in terms of reception uh, on wikipedia it just says famitsu gave it 23 out of 40 yeah oh yeah but Which it's also like not a japanese a game so i feel like famitsu was probably just like because uh, it's got it got better reception in other uh outlets so yeah yeah i i can see why they would not have liked it and i can see why a lot of people wouldn't like this game but i think that fundamentally the first two stages i'd give it like an eight out of ten and then if you call the game as a whole, I would agree with Famitsu and give it a 5 out of 10. <laughs> Yet another Alex Sammy recommendation. Mm-hmm. Hey, man, you don't always have to finish games. It's like with TV shows. Don't watch all of Game of Thrones. You'll have a good time. <laughs> uh, Rick, what about you? Um, yeah, so uh, obviously we've talked about Go Go Coca Polo. Uh, and then I've got three other retirements besides. It has been a busy week for me. So the first uh, is a game for Vita called Ghoul Boy. This game sucks. Major ass. So... <laughs> All I really need to tell you is it's a 2D platformer where triangle is locked as the jump button. Ew. All right. Move along. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, I mean, also, the, oh. the game is just horrifically put together. Uh, movement doesn't feel right. Fighting enemies like is a is a battle of attrition where you, you're just going to get hit. It felt horrific. And uh, I made the mistake of paying actual money for this. I didn't, I didn't have this on my hack keeper. I actually gave them like a pound or something, which was entirely too much money. Uh, so that that got deleted after about five minutes i also retired a game on vita called makarama this isn't bad per se imagine monument valley but without any of the artistry oh which is fine but it's just not compelling and it's a puzzle game so i got through the first world and it's like all right i've seen this now i have no yeah exactly i had no compulsion to carry on and then the last one and i literally retired this five minutes before we started recording is hyperlight drifter so mm. I played about two hours of this game before retiring it. Uh, I played the first hour, thought, and I think I said this a couple of weeks ago on the podcast, mm. I am on the verge of, of getting rid of this. Played another half hour, found some fun. I was like, oh, I actually might crack on with this. And then I've, I've just played another 20, 25 minutes, and I've, I've managed to put my finger on what's wrong, and, and I'm done. So mm. the frustrating thing is, from an audio-visual perspective, this game is stunning, like legitimately best in class. The audio, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to track a copy of the soundtrack down, um, because it is just arrestingly beautiful, uh, and the the pixel art's really well done. the The world is is full of wonder. It, it's very well realized. The problem, and I, I hinted about this last time, uh, or hinted at this last time rather, it's trying to go for this um, nonverbal communication thing. Doesn't really stick the landing. In as much as I've seen, also the beauty of the visuals is um, not in service of level design. So there's regularly things where you're expected to sort of walk at shrubbery to find hidden passages. But also, you can just walk right off the edge of the map in those hidden areas. And if there's not hidden anything. So there's this constant attrition where you're just falling off the map and losing life. On top of that, 
The combat is not good. The mechanics are clunky. And I there's a possibility, and I'm I'm willing to accept that this might be a possibility, that they're aiming for like a, a more measured, forgive me, Dark Souls type thing where you're supposed to like wait and pick your moment. If that's what it's angling for, it's not very well realized, and the enemies are super fucking aggressive, which would suggest not. So you you dash, your dash is quite short, and then your momentum completely disappears for a few frames, and then you can get hit. Some hits hit for one damage, some hits hit for two. There's no clear communication as to what that hmm. as to what that is, as to what the difference is. So occasionally I would I would take a hit and die. It's like, whoa, I thought I had like one more one more hit in that. I could talk around it for a lot, but basically it doesn't feel good to play. Yeah, and that, partic particularly for someone me is, it, like me, is just a deal breaker because that, that's what I'm looking for. So it, it was kind of a sad retirement. At the same time, it was an epic giveaway. So I've, I've not lost any sort of fun. No, I'm no foul. Just, uh, well, exactly, exactly. So it's a shame, but that one, that one's not taking any more of my time. So a friend of the podcast, Uwe, will be pleased to hear. I'm going to start Lichtum Battle Mage next nice. on PC. So that could be an interesting one. Well, let's... And speaking of what... Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I think we're about to make the same segue. Yeah, I was going to say, we should go into what we're playing then. And I might do this a little quicker because we're... We're, we're just long-winded fellows here. <laughs> um, yep, but, yep. Uh, just so we save time for the real important discussion. Uh, Paola, why don't you tell us? What are you playing? <laughs> I've made a little bit of progress on the Valilic Overs of the Vita. Not much to note yet. Hmm. Uh, but I hope, like, since I already finished Psychedelica, then I have, like, all my autumn time dedicated to this one. Nice. And then I am five hours in in my... Third run of the Lady of the Lovers of the Wild. Um, Who are, are you? you both? We're both shaking our heads. <laughs> God, oh, we're going to lose you. Like, we're probably not going to have a podcast for like three weeks when Breath of the Wild 2 launches. <laughs> Pal is just going to be um, locked away. <laughs> no, maybe. <laughs> so, yeah, like. We'll, we'll be recording with you. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Uh, if there's Kirk seats again, it's gonna be like we're just talking and suddenly there's like a yeah, ha, -ha! <laughs> <laughs> We'll hear the Sheikah slate Ching! all the time. <laughs> uh, pretty much. Hmm. So, yeah, that's been my life. That's gonna be my life for a while. I'll, I'm gonna still like try to play other games. So, yeah, Alex, what have you been playing? Yeah, so I'm still playing Mass Effect Legendary Edition. I uh, I started up Mass Effect 2. I'm only like an hour or so in. And I, I stopped for a second because I was like, wait, I don't want to like just rush through these games. I need to make sure I have a buffer. So, like, that's why I played Spyro to give me kind of like a buffer in between them. So I just went back into Mass Effect 2. Loving it, but not a lot more to report since last time. Uh, I started playing Rayman Origins because I really like Rayman Legends. And I was like, yeah, you know what? Fuck it. I got it on the Vita. Like, why not try it out? This is where I'm having a little bit. I'm just finding I'm just finding him cramped. My, my big boy hands are cramped on the Vita. That's all. <laughs> uh, uh, I loved Legends on the Vita, though. I didn't play. I played Origins on PC, but Legends on the Vita is great. I suppose the weird yeah. thing is a lot of Origins content makes it into Legends. So you've all, you've almost played it the worst way around. Yeah, so that's what I'm finding out. Um, because <laughs> Legends was amazing, yeah. but I don't remember <laughs> Legends at all. Uh, like, I just don't. Oh, I okay. just know that it was great. But I played Legends like ages ago on the PlayStation 4. So, uh, playing Origins is kind of fun. It does kind of feel a little rough around the edges in some ways. It's still great though, but like, there is just some moments where you're a little like, I think Legends probably ironed this out a little bit because Legends yeah. is, I think, a masterpiece of platforming. Um, Couldn't agree more. Yeah, but Origins is more like, a very good piece of platform, you know? Uh, that's kind of where I'm feeling with it right now. Portal 2, playing co-op with my partner. So I never actually played the co-op version because I realized that's a game where the co-op is completely different from the single-player campaign. Um, and he's excellent. Yeah, it, so far it's great. I'm loving it. My partner's also starting to get into the headspace of it. Like, oh, okay. So that's been really fun. More to report later on that. Because uh, I also realized when I... So this is the cool thing. When I booted up my Xbox Series X, Microsoft was like, hey, buddy, all these games are the games that you owned on your 360. Do you want to play them? I was like, I do want to play those. Thank you. And like, it just told me all the games that I own. So I just downloaded Portal 2 because I guess I bought Portal 2 digitally a long time ago. And I was just like, that is pretty fucking dope. So anyway, the one upside of digital, I guess, if you're, if the company is like willing to maintain it, you can actually get your games years later. But I also am playing a very old game uh, called ZZT or Z as the creator would like you to call it. Have you ever heard of ZZT? Mm -mm. So this is nope. Tim Sweeney's 
one of Tim Sweeney's first games, uh, good old Epic Games. It's an Epic Games <laughs> uh, ASCII adventure game. So ASCII, for those who don't quite know what this is, basically everything in the game is created out of characters. There's 256 characters that you can use. So the backgrounds, the graphics, everything are characters, like one, two, three. Yes, text-based visuals, effectively. Exactly. It's text-based visuals. And so this was an MS-DOS game. And you can play it online easily for free. I I wanted to get DOSBox running because I just kind of wanted to try running it on my computer. And uh, DOSBox isn't too tough, but you do kind of have to understand how, like, those old computer systems work. You know, like, you have to type in mount this, run that, you know, that kind of thing, which is its own metagame in and of itself. There's something fun about getting an old game to work on your system, right? So I got it running. And look, I'm not going to beat this game by any sense of the imagination. But the reason I started playing it is because I've been reading the boss fight books. And their third one is on ZZT. And as I was reading it, I was like, this is really fascinating because it had this world editor in it that became this really big thing for people to create their own kind of ventures. And finding out that it was like for a lot of like um, young women and also for a lot of like queer teens, it was like a really kind of invigorating and like really just empowering space to create these stories for like characters that they didn't really that they just weren't seeing portrayed in games whatsoever so it's really cool and like you can still play it and there's a bunch of different kinds it's it's it it is a great lesson in like the development of game design and like just the bullshit that was in there from the beginning but uh yeah i i recommend exploring it just to see what it is you know don't don't play it and try and beat it because god damn that's gonna be a nightmare but like just try it just try it out see what some old games were like and there's a really great games done quick speed run of it that's very funny because he's like the guy starts playing it you can find it on youtube and the commentators are like what the hell is this because it's like you know if you don't know what an ascii game is it looks insane you know tigers are like the pie symbol right lions are uh yeah, well, this is what I'm saying. There's no graphics, right? Enemies have oh, to so be symbols. Oh, it's like fucking um, dwarf, whatever it is, where like you're yeah. moving around the space. And never... Right. You're a smiley okay. face. This is what I'm saying. Amazing. It's ASCII. Like, everything is characters. So, anyway, it's really cool. Uh, Rick, why don't you uh, take us home? Absolutely. So, I, contrary to what I said last week, uh, found out that Knockout City is on PS4. So, I didn't have to fuck about with Origin. Uh, and I downloaded it and tried it out there i would recommend people check it out but the free trial thing has ended now let alone when this episode well if you have game pass if you have game pass it is free there and uh, i actually played a couple rounds with everdread um and that's how he was playing it so Hmm. i hope this game finds an audience i'm not it and i think that's purely a timing thing so for anyone who doesn't know this is a uh, 3v3 dodgeball shooter it's all auto aim um the folk it, it feels a lot like a fighting game because a lot of it's about psyching your opponents out so like if you click the right stick in, you can do a fake throw. You can pass to teammates. You can catch and throw balls back, and it picks up speed. The The art is a little bit cutesy, but it does have its own sort of feel. And mechanically, it's actually pretty good. Uh, there's a lot of fun to be had. There, there are two problems for me in terms of why I'm not going to stick with it past that period. I've already deleted it off the PS4. First is that there's a clear focus on team play. So even though the game's already been on, only been out a few days, the better teams and the people who are clearly partied up, what they do is they huddle as a three and they just ping passes around and then one of them will throw mm-hmm. a ball. And if everyone's got a ball, what you can do is just press the pass button and it'll bounce off them and you'll get it back charged as though they were. Mm. So everyone huddles together and then just throws. And in theory, there, there are counter moves to that, but people haven't really got on top of them yet. So as someone who is solo queuing for most of my time, wasn't great. Mm. And if I were to play, I'd, I'd have to try and find a couple more people to play regularly with to, to get proper enjoyment out of it. The other thing is that the time's just off. Like, I feel like I'm getting distinct early 2000s MMO vibes from a lot of these online shooters where the market's just so saturated already. And for the general population, I feel like Knockout City does enough to attract its own niche. And I really hope that it does, because like like I say, it is really good. But I've already got Rocket League and I've already got Call of Duty and there's just not space for, for that in my personal life. So that's that's where that is but it is really good played a little bit more mirror's edge catalyst i still love it in spite of its world design Mm. um having a blast with it playing a lot more of the side missions than i did first time around um and really finding the fun in those i actually played pokemon soul silver this week um i actually i actually cracked off the poker walker and onto the ds and uh, i played like three hours today (laughs) damn all right (laughs) nice yeah so I'm, i'm 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 about to go to the fourth gym the big thing for me was just getting a guide so I knew where I was going. So that one of the many quality of life things that the Pokemon series lacks, particularly this entry, is 
a half decent map i find and there's loads of other little things but when you get into the groove you can actually get past a lot of the quality of life missteps and i think this is something that i've finally gotten to click that i just wasn't the previous sort of seven or eight hours sorry I've i just it, so what's that I just, i've never i would have never imagined needing to use a walkthrough for pokemon game but that's of course if you've been indoctrinated by pokemon games uh then you know you you just know what to do but that's fair i haven't thought of that so good on you Mm -hmm. I, well part of that's also I, I put the game down for like six months yeah that so does I, it. I was sat in goldenrod city I was like, fuck am i supposed to go now and oh, i didn't really yeah. fancy walking forward and back um what it turned out is i just needed to go north effectively mm. and then there's like a, a side path that needs to cut and um there was a pseudo wudu that i actually remember seeing right at the beginning blocking my path uh, and i actually caught it and it's surprisingly powerful for where i'm at at the moment it's already level yeah. 20 it's got rock um is it rock throw i think i think rock so throw. yes but yeah. it's got some nice yeah. moves it's it's going to be useless against the next gym boss, I think, but it's uh, it's a good one. Nice. But I'm I'm having a lot of fun with that, and I I've, I've put in the in the in the notes. Ask me about the sick Poker Walker pixel art. Uh, in the interest of time, <laughs> Poker Walker pixel art is sick, and it's clearly proprietary. Nice. Because uh, the thing's got like a one inch monochrome screen, so they can't even particularly reuse hmm. Game Boy sprites, and they're clearly higher fidelity than the Game Boy sprites. But it, it, it for all of Nintendo's foibles, one of the things they tend to do quite well is attention to details like yeah. that. And all of the Pokemon have proprietary art specific for the poker walker and it elevates that experience because it looks really really good and there's just a great charm to having that two more games really quickly so the first one uh, is a game called shadow blade reload this is a port of a mobile game that i completed like seven or eight years ago and it's like gravity rush it's like the quintessential great seven out of ten and it's still great with proper controls instead of swipey bollocks yeah. So I'm really liking that. And I've put Vagrant Story down, but I'm on the title screen. Like that's what you're, <laughs> you're not about. playing Vagrant Story. What are you even <laughs> talking about? <laughs> I was playing it an hour ago. I pressed start new game. I, I'm counting that. All so right. You'll, <laughs> um, you'll hear more about that in the coming weeks. Ultimately. Nice. Well, on that oh. note, it's time to move on to the big topic of this week. Uh, it's the conclusion of Atome. <laughs> Um, Otto, maybe woo! this was a bad idea. <laughs> um, we're it, gonna. It occurred to me. It occurred to me. Yeah. Poor Paula. Me and Alex have got thoughts, and yeah. it's Paula's editing week, so she's gonna have to hear them again. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. This is torture week. Oh. But I don't know. I don't think I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be harsh on uh, Ash and Hawk for sure. But I don't have anything like bad to say about Otome's. Um, it's just. It's just Ash and Hawk. <laughs> but why don't we first? So. Paula, you wanted to do a little summary for us because we know that Ash and Hawk is technically the second game. Though, from what I understand, it's not really related to Psychedelica of the Black Butterfly, really. It's just beyond Easter eggs. But why don't you tell us a little bit about Black Butterfly? Okay, so first of all, I have to apologize because I completely forgot that there were like a couple more things that, in general, your experience would have been like more enjoyable if you, in the first place, would have uh, enjoyed Black Butterfly. And also... I don't know how representative is Dash and Hawk as an Otome game. Like, you have your usual, like, character types here and there. Well, we'll see in the discussion that there are, like, a lot of things that are different from normal. And the audience will notice the backpedaling that's happening right now. <laughs> <laughs> we're just, we're just on, joshing Paula. you there, Paula. Uh, also, obvious, obviously, there's just going to be spoilers galore here, because I'm not, we're not going to, we, come on, yeah. we're going into it. Uh, we're not going to hold it back here. No. Mm -mm. Uh, so yeah, a spoiler alert for Black Butterfly. So the game starts with the protagonist, Penny Yuri, waking up in a mysterious mansion with uh, mm -hmm. no recollection of her memories, like who she is, how she got there and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. She is attacked by a monster, but she's saved by uh, this, this guy that just was here in the mansion as well. And the moment the beast is defeated, it pretty much like explodes like in these uh, black butterflies that kind of connects with a mini game that you have to uh, shoot these black butterflies to uh, kill the beast and pretty much like keep going on with the story. She and that guy then are joined by three other people and together they must find the fragments of this thing called the Kaleidoscope to escape the fantastical place they, they are trapped in and go back to the real world. Right off the bat, they already know that something is off. As you progress through the game, everyone starts remembering snippets of their lives. Though, as the story, the same way that Asia Hawk's story is like a structure, it is like quite not linear. Mm -hmm. And the memories like come back in a non-linear fashion again. 
thanks to this, they discover like when they were kids, they, they actually like knew each other and they were like in this uh, incident because they were like exploring and saw this mansion in the middle of a, of a lake and they went to it uh, despite what the adults were saying to stay out of it. Oh, that's like exactly what happened so, in Ash and Hawk. Okay, sorry, yeah. Not quite. The thing is, is well, the that... the young kids, they all um, know each other. They go to the fucking tower. Yeah, anyway, sorry, keep going. <laughs> uh, kind of like, the point is, the kids who went there and it started like raining torrentially and they tried to go back to like the side of the lake. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, not all of them made it back. Gotcha. The One of the kids actually like drowned in the lake, saving another kid who ended up in a coma. Mm -hmm. And the the kids uh, the kid that drowned that was Natsu. Uh, his body was never found. Like even like hours or weeks after the incident. So the kid who was rescued and ended up with a coma was still in the hospital. And weirdly enough, three of the kids noticed like Benayuri, Yamato, and Karabusa uh, were in the way to nice. they, they visit the the lake to get closure on the whole incident 10 years ago okay but the bus fell off the cliff into the lake and they pretty much ended up in this psychedelic mansion the thing right. is when they were kids uh, if i remember correctly they each pick up like a piece of something uh in the mansion and mm -hmm. one of uh, each of them keep that piece the thing is that allowed them to pretty much like their souls like to pass to this other world. Okay, I'm seeing also, the Also, they notice one of. The, <laughs> yep. They also notice that one of the the people in this mansion, uh, whose name is Hikage, who was pretty much posing as this kid in a coma. Hmm. Well, they didn't know them. Uh, he was pretty much an imposter, and uh, like the. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's an imposter among us. Yeah, um, pretty much like le the Lord of the Psychedelica. He got this kaleidoscope thing from a traveler who is implied to be someone from Asian Hawk and tried to activate it in hopes to see her, that sister who, during the game, roams the mansion, uh, like in this cute little dress and a rabbit mask. Oh, so is Lawrence uh, an Easter egg to that guy then? Like Lawrence and, and, and Elric? Hold on. Okay we're, still, okay, okay. we're still there. We're getting there. Okay. The thing is... Upon activating the, the kaleidoscope, what happened then was that the lake kind of became this entry point. Something happened, the, 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 the psychedelic didn't quite like form as expected. And then like years later, the, the, the teenagers like fell into the thing and like got transported to the mansion and pretty much had to get out of the mansion. So the two ending of the game is that they finally like piece together the kaleidoscope. Uh, Benny, Yuri, Karabuz, and Yamato that we were like the survivors, which by the way, the, the game deals like on very heavy topics like survivors guilt and how each of the characters deal with that. Uh, they awakened at the hospital because like they were rescued from the van before they drowned and they were like in a coma. The kid who was in a coma after 10 long years awakened and the other three that were uh, Hikage, Natsu, and Usagi their souls wander like through the psychedelic world, like into Asian hooks. Uh, Hikagi as um, Elric and Usagi as the, the little rabbit. And Lawrence uh, was Natsu's soul from the previous game. And Lawrence actually is like the only one who retains the memories of the previous game because Hikage was pretty much broken in the same way of levy so which for the record fuck uh, levy anyway. yeah <laughs> <laughs> so yeah like the, the their three souls like kind of were like tied together their face were tied together by the kaleidoscope and pretty much wandering another adventure and that's why they're shown again i to say like Lawrence is like kind of their guardian at some extent so yeah it is convoluted i tried to get it like, so simple. convoluted i have to say you did a good job because playing ash and hawk um i can only imagine how fucking convoluted black butterfly is so the fact that i understood what you just described 
is a goddamn miracle. So well done, Paula. <laughs> I feel slightly vindicated. I joked on the Discord that anything you wrote for this segment would be better than the scenario of Ash and Hawk, and I feel like that's that's slightly come true. So can we jump into Ash and Hawk now then? <laughs> I... Yeah, we can. I just needed to get that out of the way because I noticed you two actually missed mm -hmm. out a lot because of not knowing the previous game. And I couldn't even like tell you this is important because it will be a spoiler. Yeah. Yeah. Which would have kind of been fine. Okay, so I'm going to I'm gonna take a quick stab at parts of Ash and Hawk that drive me nuts. So what you just described in Black Butterfly sort of makes sense to me because the idea in this game is that the psychedelica is like an, is like a purgatory, right? That's about the best way I could describe it. It's like an in-between of life and death. But it's and like a pocket purgatory, like it just pops yes, up in a place. It pops up in yeah. a place thanks to the kaleidovia or whatever. The, the stones get taken, a fucking death or something, and it, it triggers this thing that happens. It seems like a trauma triggers lingering ghosts is kind of the idea, right? Like that's sort of the concept but yeah, with the difference <laughs> yeah. that the kaleidoscope actually was like complete at the moment of actually like creating the space so mm -hmm. the space was created more or less in tender when the kaleidovia well well gone well what doesn't make any fucking sense to me is that what you described is that the people who were dead get stuck in this world and that's that they're stuck in the world of the dead with the dead but in this game, there's a whole fucking town. And like, also, uh, huh? the kids didn't die. Like, Jeddo, AR, whatever the fuck you want to call her. She wasn't, was she dead? She wasn't dead. Uh, neither was the, the concept. The concept was they were stuck in the real world while the kaleidoscope happens because it was incomplete when it starts. And so the ash keeps falling and they're buried. So their, their souls then are stuck in the kaleidovia. Their bodies in the real world are long since dead before we join them. That's yep. some real bullshit. Um, which, <laughs> which I'm first up. I'm gonna go. I genuinely didn't have much of a problem with that. I, I do agree there are yeah. gaping plot holes, but I didn't feel personally that that was. Okay, I just didn't understand it. I was like, they sort of explained it. I was like, what? Okay, okay, fine, fine. I'll give it that. I'll give it that. That was in the bit with Olgar. That was like at the end of chapter, was it eight or nine is, is where they tell you that bit. Okay, okay. Yeah. That's after Ash and Hawk dies. Because from what I understand, it's, it's from when Ash and Hawk falls off the tower. That's when the psychedelica fucking gets moving, isn't it? I, yeah. When Olga activates it just before Ashen Hawk comes to him, if I remember rightly, We're in yes. that ballpark, though, yeah, 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 because he because he wants to see Arya and whatever because she's dead, and I guess Jed was born right on time to be dead, and oh, I just well, there, there's lots <laughs> of things that you just have to assume. Okay, that happened. Like speaking yeah. of Jed, oh, Francisco was in the burning building to pick up the baby, who Arya just handed over to it, and then Francisco leaves, and everything's fine. Why didn't Arya just leave? anyway? Um, yeah, and I don't even care because plot holes. I don't even. But like Francisca, there are no characters in this game. There are caricatures, and this is my big problem: is that like no one is a person. Everyone is an idea. Like Levi is a fucking serial killer. And no one seems to care. Like, they play lip service to the fact that he is. But there, Levi has zero consequences for any of his actions. And his argument... Well, I mean, he dies in the end, so... Not in Everyone ending, fucking the dies way. in the end. And he doesn't die That's in the heroine. He doesn't die in the heroine's ending. Arguably, he's mm -hmm. saved. No, he doesn't die. Because... Um, sh they put the Kaleidovia back, which technically releases their souls. So no, Levi does not die. Levi is saved and his soul is to reincarnate, which also makes no sense because technically Jeddo reincarnates. Okay. Good during this because game. Because Lucas pulls out. <laughs> I thought Jed and Lucas are the together. only two that make it out. Yeah. Well, no, because... No, actually, they all of them make it out. They all make it out. Okay. The point is that if you die in the Psychedelica, your soul is trapped in the Psychedelica. But I guess Lugus, Romeo and Juliet's himself, which Lugus is the only character that I liked because at least he was complicated and interesting. I was like, all right, he was an orphan who like watched his dad die and he becomes the son of the fucking leader of the clan. And at least he's got something. At least he's brooding and hot. I'm like, I'll go for that. Levon had a mullet <laughs> and it was weird. I didn't like it. <laughs> but Levon is major creepy, man. That dude is like fucking date rapey. Like, <laughs> and he is date rapey. He's like over the bit. sleeping jet at one point. And I was like, bruh, bruh. That's what I pay. That's your brother. Like, I, I, and also it's your brother. Like, <sighs> 
and this is where I actually feel like I actually didn't have many problems with the mechanics. I know you talked about the, the map system power being like, oh, I shouldn't have given you that first off. I feel like no, if the story it, was better... It was mainly better... because Alex was complaining about the map, the yeah. map system. Listen, I, and I agree with you, Rick. Sorry, Rick, say what you're going to say. Sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting. Well, I, I was just going to say that I think the map isn't a problem. I actually don't mind that setup. The problem mm -hmm. is the story it inhabits hinders it because yes. I, I don't really care about anything within that system. And and the art and the music were, were nice enough. I mean, this, the, the town theme, I actually was, was humming along to by the end. Oh um, yeah, the town theme is like stuck in my brain. Yeah. My, pro my, my core problem, I think, was there was potentially a, a, a seed of a, a coherent narrative, something that could have worked. Mm -hmm. I think it was hindered by the fact that this is an Otome game mm -hmm. and everyone has to just love MC, even if... It's mm -hmm. oh, it's my brother for fifteen years, and I've only just found out it's a woman. But like, okay, I could, yeah, I could go for that. And <laughs> yeah, like if this game had none of that shit, where it was like trying to create some weird romance with Lavon and Levi, and if if the only romance was with Lucas, I actually think this game would have been tighter and significantly better. And if they, that's what I mean, if it was just yeah. a regular game, not an atom, if it was a regular VN, right? And if they um, didn't try to hide the fact that this was like a weird like um in between purgatory i actually think this would have been more interesting if that had been a little more front-ended um in the sense that it's like i don't know i just think it would have been a bit better because it felt like everything kept being negated like it was just like they're like here's this thing but doesn't matter here's this thing but doesn't matter here's this thing but this is what's really going on so all that doesn't matter i just and that extends to the gender bendy <sighs> stuff so like it, it that that particularly i think there could have been something to do with that but it felt quite undercooked like mm -hmm. the whole thing with t i feel like there was a lot of stuff to go for there mm -hmm. with the fact that that this girl from the other clan like is super into you and then you almost get her killed and you feel bad about it for a bit but like it ultimately doesn't particularly go anywhere uh you, you never deal with those consequences i think she tells her while she's in a coma oh i'm sorry i lied to you i'm actually a girl <sighs> never touched again male or female all the characters want to be in the pants. Doesn't matter what's in there. They yes. just want it. And the wig is enough to fool everybody, which I I struggle to believe that aspect of it also. Like, yeah. why is that believable? Because the plot has to happen. But And to be real here. Okay, if, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Paola. Uh, I think I'm going to go like, once you finish like, uh, ranting about the game, I'm gonna go like and, and start like tying everything together because a lot of the stuff that you said like never went everywhere anywhere. It comes because first of all, some of the scenes are optional because the map. No, this is the problem. This is the no, problem. I, but keep going. Hold yes. on, hold on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. And the thing is, it <laughs> often happens with some of the Otome games that have like a very long common route mm -hmm. that. Some of the blood points only get tied in a specific route. So you mm -hmm. pretty much have to like see everything to get the whole picture, which isn't always okay, especially because this one for the true ending, mm -hmm. you don't have to see everything. No. Which I got I the true ending. The link the ending is the one where you have to see everything, but then yeah. that makes it a problem to call the heroine end the true end because then we are given the assumption that we know everything we need to know. But this having is done everything also my that. issue with it. There's no narrative cohesion because of the fact that you have to see everything. There's there's no pacing in this. And like that's part of my issue is that I shouldn't have to go through all of this random shit to get the full picture. Like, I don't know. I just because because you mentioned like there are visual novels that do this branching narratives very well and they maintain a pacing like i would think you'd probably agree that something like steinsgate does it really well where it like it paces things nicely mm -hmm. even though it goes all over the place this one it just feels like they did themselves a disservice by front loading all this optional content like i actually think if they had been more interesting if they had perhaps i don't know spread those maps out a little bit and not done this thing where it's like all the because I actually thought that pace wise after the map the main major map sections ended that the pace picked up because now mm -hmm. I was like going through chapters things were happening but I felt like all that optional stuff was just and and the problem is that you can't tell what's optional and what's necessary and that's what really bothers me right is that like I couldn't tell what I actually needed to get through the story because it was just like, here's a map. You better do everything except for the pink shit. I knew that wasn't important. I fast forwarded through all of the pink shit because um, I didn't even click on them. I think I clicked on three of them. Yeah, it was I just didn't which, even... is, which is fun because like some of the pink stuff actually had like foreshadowing to some parts of the game. But the problem they should is... be marked as pink because then that's that's like signposted as filler. Also, and I. Yeah. I we Sorry. should say, play devil's advocate, Steinsgate is a time travel story. 
Yes, so it's yes, obviously yes. going to have an easier time making those branches make sense because that's that. Yeah, but it's not conceit. even about the sense. I'm but thinking about narrative pacing. Double. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Pablo. Yeah. 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 yeah, that is very double because like the the fact is that because of how everything seems to be optional, mm -hmm. it, instead if they just try to make like many choices, like mm -hmm. some of the later choices of the game, mm -hmm. then it would have like make more cohesive sense in some way. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. then you'll have to do a sequence of actions mm -hmm. that are well defined, like, okay, it's one of these, let's say these four actions. It's better signposted. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And then I think it would give narrative pacing because you would feel like, okay, I'm going through a segment here and I'm learning about something here and then I can continue on. You know what I mean? Like then it feels like a diversion that I'm more inclined to engage with. Whereas it felt like it was a chore that I had to go through. And the fact that the optional stuff, because it was in the early stages, there's only so much they can explore, right? Like they can't, you, you don't get like, it would have been lovely if later on in the game, I don't know, you had an optional side story where everyone fucking confronts Levi. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, I, like that would have been interesting in world building and fascinating and like talk about You're like- You're definitely not hung up on him specifically. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like when they make serial killers bromanced or like interesting and sexy. That fucking weirds me out, man. But I, it's also fine. Um, it was the ring. Oh my God. <laughs> The Levi character was actually pretty weird because if it wasn't for like all the serial killer stuff, it would actually have been like the most wholesome character in the game. Yes, mm. yeah, and that's why they made him a serial killer, right? Because it's like, oh, he's wholesome, but also he's, he's always got a quiet one. He yeah. wants to murder. <laughs> Uh, there's actually like a reason behind the gems, and I will explain it later because that has to do with some of the real we're already going so long that right now <laughs> while, while we're explaining things can we explain how a pendant ends up in someone's eye and that just is a thing yeah what the fuck i'm um, so like, <laughs> i think I, I messaged you both when i got to that it's just like i'm fucking done i don't care it's gone talk they, about a plot device me. also okay i want to say this so <laughs> i'm sorry pal i feel like <laughs> It's no. okay, it's okay. <laughs> but here's the deal. I, I have zero qualms about trying another Otoma game. I will I will 100% try another one. I, I'm fine with that. It, th I have problems with this game, right? And the fact is just that, mm. like, pacing-wise, it was just nuts. I also think potentially, because I kind of looked up a few, like, reviews from people who play Otome games, and there was a few mentions in some of them where they are like, oh, boy, localization on this one's a bit rough. And I was like, okay, because I yep. did sort of feel, like, at times that I was like, this feels a lot like someone, as someone who has studied some Japanese, I was like, I feel a little bit like they just took the Japanese and did the literal translation, which like can't blame them. There's a fuck ton of text in this game, so I don't know. What do you what do you think about that, Paula? Like, how is the localization on this? I've been trying. I was like very attentive to all the dialogue because with my limited Japanese, and there are like things that were like really lost in translation. Mm -hmm. Starting like for how characters see each other, like how, for example, Levi and Lava like were really like tight, really close. Mm -hmm. But uh, but for example, Jed was treated like a little bit more distance, especially for, from Lavan's point of view, and up to some extent. And there were like some phrases that were like weird because I hear like specific words on the Japanese text sure. that are either like translated literally or don't appear at all. Yeah, so it could have used some localization, like, finessing, huh? Yeah, especially, like, I don't know, like, in the way, like, the talks between, like, the more feminine voice and the more, like, mm -hmm. masculine voice because of how Japanese work. But a choice of words is important, and that choice of words is not present in English, so it sometimes just feels like you're, if you don't know Japanese, it feels like, Jed is just talking like in a more quiet feminine way like yeah voice wise doesn't Jed when Jed refers to himself is he does he use boku or ore I don't even I don't even remember ore ore he uses ore which is like the more rough masculine thing and then goes into the like watashi or whatever when when he's feminine right or does she even go in the more formal feminine I don't remember I remember hearing it but do you remember what what was the what what is, how does she refer to herself when she's AR she tried starting with Tatashi then realized it wasn't working, so she went for Watashi. Yeah, okay. Oh, she was doing Atashi and then she went to Watashi. Yeah, okay, yeah. So this is the problem. Is like in Japanese, there is such a gendered language thing that like it actually, it almost makes the gender bending work better in a way because it actually okay. feels like, yeah. it feels like AR and Jeddo are actually fairly different. But like, it seems like in, in, 
the English localization, they don't seem different at all, right? Like mm-hmm. AR seems exactly like Jed. Like there's no, there's not much of a difference, which I think is a localization problem. Likely, this is an issue when you get into niche Japanese stuff, right? That's that's narrative based. Like yep. there is, there is genuinely something lost. Um, it's one of the things with translations generally. You you just can't mm-hmm. do a once one. There's a great. Um, I can't remember the name of the channel, but it was um, in part focused around Ghost of Tsushima and a specific Japanese poem that's been yes. like tried multiple times to be translated. You might know the one I'm talking about. Just saying, like there is no true translation. Are you talking about the frog be... one, like the a frog in the pond thing? Might oh, be. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'll I'll find it later and I'll maybe link right. it. All the haikus are like that, where it's just like there's a million ways to translate them because Japanese is a language that works in what is not said. Like there's a real kind yeah. of beauty in the ambiguity of Japanese, and also because kanji and everything have like multiple interpretations. Anyway, and that extrapolates mm-hmm. out to every every piece in every language, just because yes. languages are working in different ways. And this is just and you don't need a one to one translation, but you do need someone who can localize and who can put it into uh, into ways that I don't know an English speaker can understand it, right? To get that concept, yeah. which is something that like Earthbound, yeah. for instance, does really well, right? Um, whereas this one, I think, stumbles quite a bit on that. Also, probably because they're like, what's the point of getting? a super expensive translation when they know it's a niche goddamn market of which many of the people who yeah. enjoy it have studied Japanese. <laughs> oh, <look>. Yeah, but <laughs> regarding that, like, if it's a very niche market, you really want to make the best localization you could ever mm. hope for because otherwise it's like there's fun lo- uh, fun translations that are better sometimes. Fair. Or like even like fun, uh, fun groups that just like put out like a patch, for example, in Steam to make like, I think it was like for the Science Adventure series, like Science Gate, Kyle's Head and Rodic Notes. They like pretty much homogenize like the terminology. So it would like type to get the better be- between the titles. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, Paolo, so we've shat on Ash and Hawk enough, but why don't you give us the defense of Ash and Hawk? <laughs> and if you could explain what Hugh's role is in all of it, I'd greatly appreciate that, because I'm going to fucking... I actually didn't mind Hugh. He was wife. neat and mysterious. And I, okay, I will say, I liked the ending of this game. I did think, flash forwarding to the future and the reincarnation, I, I like the idea that's a very... Um, like Japanese kind of thing and I really I dug that I like reincarnation stories and the ideas that our souls continue on throughout the like the 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 years without us knowing but yeah and I love that right up until it cut to the riverbank and he was just there floating like mm, that story had a happy ending it's like who the fuck are you I know he's kind of like a <laughs> so, watcher yeah Ugh. It is funny because like the, the way like you two were playing, I already knew like all the story, and my boyfriend was playing was playing too, like with me. Mm-hmm. I felt like he was just there eating popcorn because I saw that guy just appear when everything went to shit. I was just eating popcorn the whole time. We actually like said he was like the popcorn arca- arcana or something like that. We unlocked mm-hmm. the popcorn ar- arcana when he said like. Uh, I won't be like a stand there, a stand by like anymore. I'm gonna like try to like mm-hmm. root for you like in this thing. Yeah. Is so, he a god? Yeah. Like <laughs> he seems like a god of some kind. I am not completely sure like what kind of existence he is, but if you go through all the endings, I'm gonna like put it like mm-hmm. in a more chronological order. So mm-hmm. you know how there were like these four people, like two from the hogs and two from the yep. yeah, the wolves. So and do you mean Aya, is, Francisca, Olgar, and Atra? Yeah. The okay. thing is, first of all, Apros was pretty much born with the heart of a beast. That was in the sense of he, he pretty much went ahead and just harm people or harm things or like mm-hmm. pretty much didn't quite fit uh, with society and he was then uh, sent to the tower where there was like this woman who could quote unquote treat him the mm-hmm. thing is there uh, this woman had a hawk called asia okay. and also like the, this woman had like these comments this powers and stuff and the thing is is that uh, after a series of events and ma- many days just like living life and stuff Everest just killed the hawk and the witch did a thing where the hawk was like turning to this, the spirit of the hawk was turning to this butterfly. And butterflies in mythology, you know, all, are supposed to guide the souls of the people mm. uh, to the other world, to the other life, and stuff like that. Uh, that hawk was actually Hugh. I see. Uh- the thing is, April's like was given the Kaleidovia, the yeah, the Kaleidovia, and said, and the woman said, okay, my job here is done, I'm going away. 
but also this is your best card, your best heart is inside this thing. And she said that he would like soon meet people from the other clan and like very much like you will make friends, try to make friends with them. Mm. Uh, that woman was a, a witch and also was Arya's mother, which by the way, Arya in a similar way that Jed wasn't like raised by her mother but pretty much like given to someone else to take care of her. So the whole time I thought like Ibrus and Arya were like siblings, but they weren't. And I was like, oh, I see. That's why Francisca then thought like stuff happened between them. But uh, moving on like with this Oh story, yeah, I thought there were like, siblings too. That was really weird, but that makes more sense. Yeah, it, it is still like convoluted as heck. Yeah. But then like the four people, like the, the four of them like met and stuff. And the thing is, is that Olgar, and this is like very fucked up because Francisca didn't have like a very good childhood. Like she actually mm -hmm. tried talking to someone from the other clan. Mm -hmm. And their parents were fucking monsters because they enclosed her into this uh, attic room where mm -hmm. Jet was kept for a while. And no food and like actually like physical punishment stuff. So I am starting to think like her twisted personality comes from that. Uh, but she, she also has like legit brother problems because I think she didn't like Olgar like just a brother. But the thing is, it's like, okay, if Olgar, if my brother says uh, we, we must do this to like mm -hmm. fix everything in this town, I'm gonna do what he says. So then like fast forward uh, in time and then you have like Olgar and Arya and Abrus and, and Francisca like Marion. And the thing is, around that time is when Hugh comes to town and he's like, Oh, have you ever had a, um, have you ever like lost someone and want to see them like revive and stuff like that? And this is one of the parts that I don't quite understand. It's like Asian Hook, sorry, Abrus crafted the rings with the, with the stones that were supposed to be like his special heart. And so... they don't say why. Yeah. And they don't say exactly why, but at the time he thought like these are like tokens of friendship in the sense that if I pass them to my friends, it's like they literally have like one of the most important things from me. And pretty much it's because I guess that like best your heart thing like got passed down like to Levi like and that and that is like the start of like his killing disorder and the stone that like, just amplified. <sighs> Mm -hmm. God damn. Because the stone was already bad, bad. But the thing is, Hugh. Oh, God damn it, Hugh. Um, he also like shape shifted like to get information from the other places, right? Mm -hmm. When you click on that uh, pink button, like the pink places on the map, you're. I think you're actually Hugh asking the questions because when you replay the maps, you actually can talk to Jet. Oh, interesting. Oh, okay. But, you know, I think what I'm learning here is that I hate this form of storytelling <laughs> where it's like <laughs> ooh, mysterious it's just too convoluted right and like i get i okay look i have to you know air my clear biases where it's like i'm raised in this like it's very much like the western european form of storytelling which is like the very like clear narrative arcs and whatnot um and so i think what you're seeing here is like a type of storytelling that it, it is just different and it's also working like you've mentioned within symbols that are probably clearer to a Japanese audience, oh, like you know, the butterflies and stuff, yeah, yeah, that give like that that create illusions, and so probably some of the shit that I'm facing, they pro maybe like someone who's playing it with, with like a real deep understanding of Japanese culture probably wouldn't find as difficult. But it's it's almost like honestly, you know, the Romeo and Juliet comparisons, it feels a little bit like I was reading a Shakespeare of another type of friggin' um, uh, country where I was just like, man, you're referencing some shit that I do not get, you know? <laughs> mm. Oh, also because I wasn't done with the Hugh stuff. Oh, you yeah, also like oh sorry and this is like kind of a, a, some time in my part but the cycle dedica like there's no time in the right in the sense of you can follow forwards in time and backwards in time and that's pretty much like why he can do his like time traveling stuff mm -hmm. because he said oh you don't know romeo and juliet it hasn't been invented yet mm -hmm. yes he does say that yeah um and also <laughs> because deep side aria actually Mm -hmm. Being a witch, what she was able to do, she knew she knew the future. Okay. Not only she knew the future, but Asian Hawk being he being this ephemeral existence. Since he was like I, I guess he was like in some sort of familiar contract with her mother being a witch and now like he, he follow around Arya being a win being the witch. Um since Arya knew she was going to die, she, she pretty much like 
uh, had he like writing the stories of the, all the different out outcomes from very much psychedelic the the whole psychedelic games. So That's he why like, he becomes a narrator in terms of okay. He was a narrator. He also studied like storytelling from different parts of the of the world, and he always was writing the journal whatever he saw, not because it was of interest to him, but it was because it was of interest to Arya. Sorry, my brain is turning too much trying to like. My brain is much. Together. I can relate. Yeah, I, I can relate. This is this Jesus. is probably the time to to call Diamond Otome generally and and what a whirlwind psychedelica has been for all three of us. Uh, but for anyone who's got an enthusiasm wants to to play and explore a little bit more, um, I think you've prepared a few recommendations for us, pal, haven't you? Yeah, I actually went out on Automate Twitter and got some recommendations and pretty much like got my uh, top five options written right here. And first of all, Number I'm five, sure I'm code realized. <laughs> uh, actually, it is on the list, but Amnesia Memories was like one of the top voted because it yes. it actually was the first one for many people. Oh, okay. So uh, you play as the heroine whose, whose memories disappear and seeing a pattern here after an encounter with a fairy-like being. Her life depends on hiding her memory loss while she navigates through complex relationships and finds a way to remember her past and identity. So this was was recommended because the routes are like really separated from the get-go. You very much like click on a menu and you're like in the route already. It is pretty time compared with other Atomes and has a good variety of bachelors. It is available on Steam, PSP, and PS Vita. What was the title of that one, sorry? Amnesia Memories. Amnesia Memories. Oh, okay. Second one, could realize Garden of River. <laughs> uh, Kurt is a girl who lives on an abandoned mansion. She has no recollection of her past, save for her promise with her father to wait for his return. And he swears that she must never know love, that she's a monster. As a deadly poison that rots and melts everything that she touches runs through her body. Her life of solitude is flipped upside down when a group of soldiers capture her. And the gentleman thief Arsene Lupin takes her away from the captures. Isaac Beckford has gone missing. And Cardia now finds herself on a journey to locate her father and hopefully her memories. Available on PS Vita, PS4, and Nintendo Switch. The upsides are that it has a very likable cast uh, main character, interesting story, but the common road is very, very long. But on the other hand, it has like very common equipment types and, and it is very tame and it, it will give you like an overall picture of what Otome is. Then we have Cinderella Phenomenon. Four years after the end of the Great War and the loss of her mother, Crown Princess Lucette of Aguil is still struggling to come to terms with her new life and step family. Called Harder and Bitter, Lucette's life is one second turned upside down by the fairy tale curse. Uh, she goes from riches to rags and is erased from everyone's memories, everyone but others like her. She must find a way to break the curse and regain her crown in a fractured kingdom. Available on Steam and each IO. This one is very short, is very light compared to other entries, and it is free. Characters bodies. The story follows Hoshino Ichika, a police officer who works at Shinjuku Tokyo, which is currently on lockdown thanks to a series of crimes known as the Extec Incident. When out on her usual patrols, she is attacked and a collar with poison is placed around her neck. She gets directly involved with investigating the ex day incidents with a group of former police officers. They need to solve the case before the timer plays on her life and Shinkyuku runs out. Available on PS Vita and Steam, this one, the common road is like very, very short and you pretty much like jump into it immediately. The story is like pretty engaged. Uh, and finally, Nightshade. Thanks to an age of constant war, the Iga and Koga had independently achieved an expansion of their respective forces. Both Shinobi forces, owing that long history of, of warring, share an antagonistic relationship and mutual hatred towards one another. However, there is war, the few Iga members that had survived were taken in by the Koga forces, and 17 years later, the Sengoku period had come into an end and lasting peace came to the world. Dreaming of performing Shinobi duties, Ueno Enju, the protagonist, daughter of the Koga Forces leader, Ueno Kondo, has been training every day after finally being selected to go on her first mission. A major incident occurs. It not only derails Enju's fate, but the fate of the village as well. And this one is available on PC and Nintendo Switch. And it has a shorter common route, an interesting story, and it is pretty tame. Cinderella phenomenon is like a little bit less recommended, but it's still like very recommended because it is free. 
like you can go wrong with free and the other four like are very tame compared to other things that are out there uh and with the exception of cloud realize like everyone has like uh, either no common route or a very short common route so you can like go straight to the story and honorable mentions pretty much is like with the messenger that i haven't played but it is free to play on mobile the only thing that it has time specific events so you will be awake at 4 a.m answering your virtual boyfriend uh, some phone messages so <laughs> that is it oh that was a live well there we go um that was quite the discussion uh, and now it's time for us to move on to how long to beat how long to beat the, the game, game. What are we playing for, Paula? Okay, let me grab this real quick. I need to breathe. Yeah, <laughs> take a breath. <laughs> uh, okay, there we go. Yoshi's the story. Voice took your breath away. For the Yoshi's story. <laughs> <laughs> huh? uh, Yoshi's story for the Nintendo 64. Oh. Ooh, the the two and a half D platformer. I don't remember this one. I don't think I ever played it. It's a little it. bit like Kirby 64, if I remember correctly. Hmm. It's that sort of thing. And I'll uh, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna jump straight in. Mm. I'm gonna I'm gonna hail Mary a six hour, six hour, six hour. Yeah, I don't think it's very long. Um I'm I was I was burnt by Mario Super Sluggers. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna overthink this. I, I agree. I'm gonna do six, seven, eight, I think. Um Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm gonna go eight, six, seven. No. Is it? Um like Yoshi can so aren't like they can be a collective one, but there isn't like too much. So I'm they gonna can, go six and a half. Yeah. Sorry, go on. Oh, again with the half hours. <laughs> Why are you so against the half hours? They've saved us a number oh, of times. <laughs> just back yourself think, an hour. None at of this, this point, I just bullshit. do it because because you know, Rick speak. hates it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Oh, wow. that serves me right for not liking Psychedelica. Um, should I unravel the times? Uh, yes. Oh, wow, there was... I'm doing six, seven, eight. Yeah. All right, go ahead. What, what okay, got so main story, two and a half hours. Nice. Main plus extras, nine hours, and completion is nine hours. Nice. We survive another round. We all made it. So another Five boring week because it's 53 points for Rick, 48 for Alex um 45 for power <laughs> so we are for yet another week my supremacy is maintained yeah there you go um thanks for tuning in everybody to our big old at home episode uh we'll see y'all next week with our with hopefully a special special little guest and that's that bye-bye take it easy bye